So, um, welcome to uh, what we're, well, we are one of the measurement sphere groups and the better one, of course. And um, we're going to obviously kind of talk you through the different meso methods of how to mesh a sphere. Now, I know you're thinking already, what is meshing a sphere? Well, it's when you take a 3D sphere and you kind of you change it and you turn it into a 2D plane. For example, one of the first ways you can mesh a sphere is the latitude and longitude mesh, where is, which is mainly used, you know, you see in maps when you just look at the world map as you do. And uh, Weber uses it quite a lot as well. And um, what, um, the way it's done is you, you make it up of, orth oh, I can't even say this word, orthogonally rectangular grids, which means that you have the lines like perpendicular and you try and keep all the angles the same. Uh, yeah, you try and keep like, all the angles the same of the grid. And it's, uh, it's quite like, an easy and it's the most used mesh that we use at the moment. The latitude longitude mesh is the most widely used mesh in the world, but it has a number of problems when trying to model, say, climate on supercomputers. Since each core handles a single cell on the mesh, and they have to communicate as weather patterns spread across the globe. But towards the poles, the cells become much closer together, so many, many more cores have to communicate with each other, which can drastically slow down the computation. So in this, we say that the latitude longitude beauty mesh is not very uniform, but there are various ways of measuring uniformity. The latitude and longitude mesh is uniform in the fact that all the angles on the mesh are equal within 90 degrees. It also is equal in the dimensions as all of the divisions are at regular intervals. You can also have uniformity in the form of area, where all the cells are the same area, or shape, such as a, a geodesic grid. There are very, very few meshes which are perfectly uniform in all of the ways, but they're too small to be really useful. So, how can you mesh a sphere? One way is using platonic solids. What are platonic solids? I am very glad you asked. <laughs> platonic solids are 3D shapes that all have the same polyhedron, which is just a 2D shape, on each side. And that means they have identical uh, edges. They're all the same length. There can only ever be five platonic solids, though, because the interior, the angles around the points, have to add up to less than 360. Uh, so you've got a flat, so a flat edge, which is not good. You can have three triangles, four triangles, five triangles, three squares, or three pentagons. Now you're thinking, oh, I'll never use these platonic solids in real life. Apparently not, because the slide's gone. <laughs> <laughs> but you can find them in tetrahedrons, which is like a pyramid of Giza. Well, it's like it, but it's not a square base. A cube, like a dice. An octahedron, like a dice. A dodecahedron and an icosahedron, like a dice. <laughs> oh, there they are. <laughs> so, do they form a perfectly uniform mesh of a sphere? Yes, they absolutely do. But the resolution's too bad to be used for anything. As you just heard, the cosmonic solids were too low a resolution to use for any real life problems. So, if you, you can increase the resolution by triangulating the faces, which means to divide them into equal triangles, and then keep subdividing these triangles to make more equal triangles, and then project it up onto a sphere. And as you can see from the final image, this gives you a very high resolution mesh, although some of the uniformity is slightly lost. Um, Euler's polyhedral formula states that for a polyhedron or 3D shape, that V plus F equals E plus 2. And again, the slide seems to have disappeared. Um, but it basically means that the number of vertices plus the number of faces is equal to the number of edges plus 2. And it's true for most convex polyhedra, which is where all the vertices are pointing outwards, some non convex, and all the platonic solids, which I'll go on to explain. Euler was a Swiss mathematician in the 18th century, and he, was, he developed many areas of maths, including calculus, number theory, and more importantly, geometry. The relationship between the number of ver vertices, faces, and edges was initially written down by Descartes in the 17th century. However, it was refined to this formula by Euler, so it's credited to him. 
there are many proofs of the formula, and also lots of applications outside matching a sphere. For example, no simple polyhedra can have seven edges, but that goes into quite some detail, and it's on our poster which you can see outside. In the, con oh. in the context of matching a sphere, um, you can use it to prove that there are only five platonic solids, um, which is useful because they're perfectly uniform, which is useful for measuring for matching a sphere. Um, so if we call C the number of edges coming to each vertex, so for example on a um, cube, three faces come to each vertex, and if we call N the number of edges surrounding each face, so again for a cube that would be four, we can express V and F in terms of C and N, and we can actually create this inequality up there, um, which says that for a sphere whose faces are all the same polygon, or um, platonic solid, the number of sides of the polygon making up these faces can only be three, four, or five, all made up of triangles, squares, or pentagons. Um, with this restriction, we can further prove that there are only five different combinations of C and N, hence five platonic solids, and it's shown in the table there. So the formula is sort of useful for proving that the platonic solids aren't actually that useful in matching a sphere, but like Hannah said, you make them a uh, high resolution. Um, so this is Delaunay triangulation. Um, so Boris Delaunay was a renowned mathematician uh, and rock climber, incidentally, uh, who did lots of maths in the 20th century. Um, now he developed a technique called Delaunay triangulation. Uh, so take, say we take seven points, <coughs> pseudo randomly arranged, as we can see. Um, the idea is, is that we want to get a mesh uh, like this, but how we get that is we put for each um, set three points, we make a circle uh, where each of the points is on the circumference that is the edge of the circle. Um, so if we do that for one triangle, get this, but um, there are special rules about this, so every single circle has to be empty, that is no points are in it. Um, so if we do this for all the circles, we get this. Now, um, if we then connect up the lines from all the circum circles, we get the original um, triangulation, this. Um, now, if we add the centers of the circles in, we get this. If I can use this later, which I can't. <laughs> there we are. There, there we go. Um, so from that, you can get a Voronoi diagram where each one of these points, the red ones, that is, uh, represents a vertice or corner of the Gorgia triangulation, as Hannah will now explain. Ta-da! <laughs> Borodoi diagrams are simply an area, which is the section from smaller areas, based on the distance from any point on the diagram to the closest site. A site is one of the dots, which as you can see, is spread across the diagram, and they represent an object, such as a, such as a school. The Verona diagrams, part of, they represent an area which is enclosed from all the points closest to a site than any other site. We call these Voronoi cells. And Voronoi diagrams can be used in application to Voronoi problems, such as uh, catch, finding catchment areas for a school where each of the sites would be the schools and each of the Voronoi cells would be the houses closest to that school, therefore the catchment area for that school. These diagrams show you how they look when they're projected onto a sphere. The first one shows a more uniform mesh with the pentagons all fairly equal size and shape. But the second image shows as you try and increase the resolution by increasing the number of faces, the uniformity of the mesh is decreased, which shows how hard it is to uniformly mesh a sphere to a high resolution. Um, so this is all well and good, but it sounds very pure actually, but how is this actually going to affect you members of the audience? Um, climate change is real and it's affecting us all the time. Recently we've been seeing many storms, such as the one in Cumbria, Storm Desmond, and we've been having storms in 2015 and 2014. Um, you can see Dawlish there being destroyed by the storms. These storms are only going to increase in frequency. Um, 
Now the thing is, is that if we can make our programs more efficient, we can detect these storms coming earlier, um, and that means lives will be saved, because people will die from this. Uh, so if we can mesh a sphere more efficiently, it means lives will be saved. Wow, that was a bit... a bit... You know, <laughs> killed the fun of it, didn't it? So, uh, to conclude, there are many various different ways that you can mesh a sphere. All have positive points and all have negative points, but there isn't really one specific way to mesh a sphere that's perfect, that's the right resolution, <coughs> and all that jazz. So, uh, we would just like to thank our professor, John Furban, and our mentor, Rachel Smith. Uh, a big thank to her, because she had to put up with our group, um, Let's just say, we, we didn't work that well together, but we, we pulled it out in the end, as you, can, as you watch. Thank you very much. <laughs>